Our sermon title this morning is God's Faithful Yes. God's Faithful Yes. And we're looking at this text in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 15 through 22. Now, as we begin to consider our text this morning, I want to remind us of something. For some here, I want to convince you of something. Maybe you're not convinced of this already. Uh, maybe you believe that you are and you need further convincing. Maybe others are convinced they need reminding. Uh, I want to remind us of something here from the Word of God so that by way of reminder, in looking at our text in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 15 through 22, uh, we might properly apply important lessons from this text, right? And unless you are convinced of this, it's going to be difficult for you to properly apply what Paul is speaking of here, what Paul is doing, what Paul is demonstrating by way of example in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 15 to 22. Here's what I want to convince you of in our text, from our text this morning. If you profess to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, then you are called to great commission ministry. If you profess to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, then you are called by the Lord Jesus Christ to ministry, specifically great commission ministry. You are called to make disciples. As we think through that calling, we think through that ministry that every single genuine Christian has been given, we want to look at the example of Paul. Paul clearly understood his call to salvation as a call to a life of ministry for the Lord Jesus Christ. When Paul was converted, Paul was converted to ministry. He was converted to serve the Lord Jesus Christ in ministry, this side of heaven, for the glory of his name. Now, as he opens this letter, Paul describes himself in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 as a sent one of Jesus Christ by the will of God. That's what an apostle is. An apostle is a sent one. He is a sent one of Jesus Christ by the will of God. He quite often in his letters describes himself as a bondservant, as a doulos, a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. Philippians chapter 1 verse 1, Paul and Timothy, bondservants, douloi, slaves of the Lord Jesus Christ. Galatians chapter 1 verse 10, if I still pleased men, Paul said, I would not be a bondservant, a slave of Christ. Titus chapter 1 verse 1, Paul, a bondservant, a doulos, a slave of God, and an apostle, a sent one of Jesus Christ. So Paul is a slave. Paul is a bondservant of the Lord Jesus Christ. To what end or for what purpose? Turn with me to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. Look at Romans chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. Paul has been called as a bondservant of the Lord Jesus Christ, as a slave of the Lord. He is a sent one of the Lord Jesus Christ, an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. To what end or for what purpose? Look at Romans chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. Here it is again. Paul, a bond servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, Concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Now notice verse 1. Paul here is separated or set apart. Aphorizo is the Greek word. It means to be set apart, marked off. Paul is separated or set apart to the gospel. Now that word, the verb there, aphorizo, set apart, is passive. It's considered a divine passive, meaning that God himself is the one who is setting Paul apart. God set Paul apart to gospel ministry. That verb there, aphorizo, is also in the perfect tense. Now, I want you to understand a bit of the grammar here with respect to that. The perfect tense Paul is separated, set apart, that's in the perfect tense, speaks of completed action in the past. Paul was completed action in the past, set apart to gospel ministry. But the emphasis of the perfect tense 
is the present reality that exists because of that past completed action. In other words, Paul was in the past set apart by God to the gospel, and that has unquestionable implications for how Paul now lives his life in the present. Does that make sense? That point then is further emphasized by the fact that Paul was not merely separated by the gospel, but Paul was separated to God to the gospel, separated by God to the gospel. In other words, Paul was saved. He was redeemed on the road to Damascus, knocked off his horse, his eyes opened. He was set apart by God for God's work, set apart by God to the gospel. Now, what does it mean then to be set apart to the gospel? Look at verse 5. Through him, Paul says, we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. Right? Now, verse 5 is a statement of the Great Commission. Why was Paul set apart by God to the gospel? For, verse 5, obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. Now, obedience to the faith here, obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, is synonymous with a gospel call to salvation. Paul was set apart for obedience to the faith. That obedience to the faith is synonymous with the gospel call to salvation. And that does not mean that people are saved by their obedience. Make sure we understand that correctly, right? People are not saved by their obedience, but rather that people are saved to obedience. See the distinction? Paul received grace, received a calling on his life for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. People are saved to obedience. People are saved to good works, which God prepared beforehand that they should walk in them. In other words, they are set apart by God to the gospel. People are set apart by God to the gospel. Now notice also verse 5. Notice also verse 5. This work is for the sake of his name, the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, for the sake of his name. Then, I want you to see, Paul makes a very important connection for them, the recipients of his letter, for you and I. He makes a very important connection in verse 6. Among whom, in other words, among the nations, among the nations, you, Paul says, also are the called of Jesus Christ. In other words, Paul says, I've not been called to this work alone. The word called there in verse 6 is the same word Paul uses, called in verse 1. Paul was called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God in verse 1. You also are the called, the called of God, set apart to the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel of God for the sake of his name. You also are the called. Paul's saying, I've not been called to this work alone. As I was called, verse 1, separated to the gospel, you also, you also are the called of Jesus Christ. You and I have been called to gospel ministry. You and I have been called into gospel ministry. Verse 7, to all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now how does Paul then, how does Paul view this calling? How does he view the work of that he's been called to, this work that we've been called to. There are many ways in which Paul understands this, many ways in which he understands this. How does he view it here? And we already saw how this work of the gospel is for the sake of his name in verse 5. But look now, drop down to verse 14. How does Paul view this calling? He says in verse 14, I am a debtor both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to wise and to unwise. Now, Greeks and barbarians, wise and unwise, are parallel statements. Greeks were thought to be wise. Barbarians were thought to be unwise. Paul was indebted to both. He was indebted to both. He was indebted to educated and uneducated. Rich, poor, slave, free. Anyone who was lost and in need of the gospel, Paul was indebted to them with the gospel. Why? Because Paul had been separated by God 
to the gospel for the sake of his name. Now, certainly, Paul was indebted to Christ, right? Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14, that because Christ died, we, those who are in Christ, we die in him. And we are no longer to live then for ourselves, but we're to live for him who died for us and rose again. So then what does it mean in verse 14 that Paul was not simply indebted to the Lord Jesus Christ, but indebted here to the lost? What does it mean that Paul was indebted to the lost? Paul's been given a treasure. Paul understands that. He says, we've been given this great treasure in earthen vessels, in clay pots. You and I, if you're in Christ, would you say amen to the fact that you've been given a treasure? Amen. That treasure treasure has been entrusted to you. You've been given a great treasure. And that's a treasure that you are responsible to share. It's a stewardship that has been entrusted to you. To you, Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, that the gospel preached to us is a treasure that we, weak earthen vessels, have been given. Let me explain it this way in a very sort of mundane way. If I give you, if I give you a $20 bill, and I tell you that I'm going to give you this $20 bill on the condition that you're going to share it with a friend, I've just indebted you to that friend, haven't I? If I give you the $20 bill, you're then indebted to share it with that friend. We've been given an an immeasurable treasure. We've been given the unsearchable riches of Christ. We are indebted then to share it. Now what happens if I give you that $20 bill, you don't give it to your friend. What are you doing to your friend? You're robbing from your friend. Right? You're robbing them of the treasure that I've entrusted you to share with them. We've been given an immeasurable treasure. Paul was given an immeasurable treasure, and he viewed that gift of God's grace as an indebtedness to the nations, to the Gentiles, to the lost. How then does Paul respond to this stewardship of the gospel? Look at verse 15. Paul doesn't respond with heartless, dutiful, begrudging obedience. Paul responds with earnestness. Verse 15, so as much as is in me, Paul says, with all zeal, with all earnestness, with all commitment, with all readiness, as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. This is Paul's understanding, not only of the life of an apostle, but this is Paul's understanding of the life of a Christian, the life of a Christian. Now, please don't get the wrong impression here. This was no cold, heartless obligation on the part of the apostle Paul. Gospel zeal, verse 15, poured from Paul's heart. We see this in in several places in Paul's letters. He said in Romans chapter 9, verse 1, listen, Paul said, I am telling the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart. For I wish that I myself were accursed, separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Paul had earnest zeal in his heart for lost people, wanted to see the Jews and the Gentiles saved for the glory of Christ's name. Now, you may not be called on missionary journeys to Asia and Macedonia and Achaia and Rome, but you are called. If you're a Christian, then you are called to missionary work right here at home where the Lord has planted you. You've been given a ministry. You've been called, separated by God to the gospel for the glory of his name. For the sake of his name. For the sake of the lost. For the sake of your brothers and sisters here. If you are called. If you've been called, you've been called to that ministry. Look with me at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 
And drop down with me there to verse 17. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. You've been called. If you have been genuinely saved, transformed, indwelt with God's Spirit, you've been called to this ministry. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, Paul says, if anyone's in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now, all things, all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and what? And has given us. Now, that's not an editorial us on the part of Paul. Paul is speaking of all Christians. He's speaking of his brothers and sisters. He has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and he has then given us us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, verse 19, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation, the gospel. If you're a Christian, you're saying, I've been set apart to this work. I've been set apart to this ministry. This now is the life that I live. And I live that life for him who died and rose again. Now then, Paul concludes, verse 20. Now then, we, not an editorial we, he's speaking to you and me. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. He, he, you can hear the emotive energy, can't you, in Paul's statement. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you to be... That's not how the text is to be read. It's not faithful to the, um, the emotion of the text. We implore you on Christ's behalf. We plead as though God were pleading through us. Be reconciled to God. If you're here today and you are not saved, you are enemies of God by your wicked works. We implore you as his messengers, as his ambassadors, as his emissaries, be reconciled to God. For your soul's sake, don't die and go to hell. Be reconciled with God. He offers as a free gift of his grace reconciliation in Jesus Christ that if you will turn from your sin and put your faith in him you can be saved your sins can be forgiven and you can be given the unsearchable riches of Jesus Christ forgiveness from your sin eternity in heaven with him for he, verse 21, made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him Peter says it this way, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. Peter says, listen, you are a chosen generation. If you're in Christ, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, so that for the purpose that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light who were once not a people, but now are the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. The glorious good news of the gospel is that your sin-wrecked relationship to your maker, God, can be reconciled through turning from your sin and trusting in Christ alone. Your sin can be forgiven your guilt can be removed. God's wrath toward you satisfied. The enmity between you can be taken out of the way and nailed to the cross. And if you have believed, if you have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ for that good news, if you've believed in the Lord Jesus Christ for that word of reconciliation, then that word of reconciliation now has been entrusted to you. It's been entrusted to you. You have been made a debtor both to wise and unwise. You've been made now a debtor to Greeks and to barbarians. You've been made a debtor to young and old, rich and poor, male, female, slave, free. You've been called to preach the gospel to every creature, the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Paul said of himself, 
in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 8, Paul says, to me, right, to me, who am the least of all the saints, Paul says, this grace was given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. By way of illustration, I'm reminded of the example of four leprous men in 2 Kings chapter 7, if you're familiar with that story from the Old Testament. Syria goes up and lays siege to the city of Samaria, the capital city of Israel, the northern kingdom. And because of that siege, there's a great famine in the city. The text says that for food, for food, a donkey's head was sold for 80 shekels of silver, about a pound of silver. For food, dove droppings were sold for five shekels of silver. In the account, in 2 Kings chapter 6, there was a conflict during the siege, during the famine, where two, two women agreed to boil their sons and eat them. So they ate the first woman's son, and then the second woman refused to give up her son, and a conflict ensued. This was an unimaginable tragedy, a horrific famine, horrific circumstances in Samaria. But the account in 2 Kings chapter 7 tells of four leprous men sitting at the city's gate. They say to one another as they sit there in the gate, they say, why are we sitting here until we die? If we say we will enter the city, well, the famine is in the city and we shall die there. And if we sit here, they said to themselves, we die also. Presumably they're going to die from their leprosy. Now, therefore, come, they said to each other, let us surrender to the army of the Syrians. If they keep us alive, we shall live. And if they kill us, we shall only die. We're going to die anyway. Do you see what they were thinking? So that's what they do. These four leprous men take off for the camp of the Syrians. Well, in the meantime, as they're taking off for the camp of the Syrians, the Lord orchestrates this glorious rescue of the city. It's a glorious rescue. You need to go back and read that text. He causes the army of the Syrians to hear chariots and chariots in the middle of the night. And in hearing these chariots, the Syrian army flees for their lives, leaving everything behind them. So by the time the four leprous men reach the camp of the Syrians, the army is gone, their tents abandoned. They literally left everything as it stood. Tents, horses, clothing, gold, silver, food. It was a vast treasure trove left abandoned in the camp of the Syrians. So then what do the four leprous men do when they come across this abandoned camp? They go, as you would think that they might, from tent to tent to tent, eating their fill, taking off gold and silver and going and hiding it and burying it in the ground for themselves. They're hoarding the treasure to themselves. They're hiding it, right? And they go on for a bit doing this until they finally come to their senses in 2 Kings chapter 7, verse 9. Then they said to one another, we're not doing right. We are not doing right. This is a day of good news. And we remain silent. If we wait until morning light, some punishment will come upon us. Now, therefore, come, let us go and tell the king's household. And we can make the application, right? The application is clear. Those still lost in their sin are in a far worse condition than those starving in the city of Samaria, eating one another's children to stay alive. We, who were once covered in the leprosy of our sin, have been given a far greater treasure trove from the Lord, have we not? If we remain silent, we are not doing right. We're sitting before the Lord. This is a day, this is a day of good news. Amen? This is an age, this is a time 
of good news. This is the time of the new covenant. This is the time of good news. If we remain silent, some punishment will come upon us. Paul says, woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. Necessity has been laid upon me. Necessity has been laid upon us as well. We've been called to preach the gospel. Paul says, if I do this willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, I have been entrusted with a stewardship. If you profess to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ and you are called to great commission ministry, are you convinced? <laughs> if you are convinced, then you see, you see your indebtedness in much the same way that Paul saw his indebtedness. You see your responsibility to ministry in much the same way that Paul saw his responsibility to ministry. In Paul's example in 2 Corinthians, particularly Paul's example in the midst of great affliction, in the midst of persecution, Paul's example in 2 Corinthians is particularly helpful and particularly instructive and encouraging. Paul tells us in Philippians chapter 4, the things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do. And the God of peace will be with you. God has called you and I to gospel ministry. You and I have been set apart. If you're in Christ, you've been set apart by God to the gospel for the sake of his name. That's a ministry among God's people. And it's a ministry to the lost. It's a ministry among God's people and a ministry to the lost. The sanctification of the saints and the salvation of the lost, right? That's the will of God for you if you're a Christian. Because sin doggedly persists in the human heart, that ministry is going to be conducted in some degree of affliction. The Lord faced it, and we are not greater than our master. The apostle Paul faced it, and so will we. We'll face it also. So I want to continue to exhort us this morning, right? For us to think about our lives as Christian ministry. Whatever you do, that's not your ministry. If you work in architecture, you work as a teacher, you're a student, you're a nurse, you're a nurse, a student, an architect, as an ambassador of Christ. You have a ministry. You've been given a ministry. You've been made a debtor. Devote yourself to gospel ministry for Jesus Christ, right? The love of Christ compels us. Don't live for yourself. I cannot live for myself. I must live for Christ who died for me and rose again. As we think about that now, turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. In verse 15, we want to learn from the example of Paul in his ministry to these dear people in Corinth. To the lost in Corinth, certainly, but to the brothers and sisters also in Corinth and how he ministered to them. And we're to follow Paul's example. We are to pour ourselves out, as Paul did, on the sacrifice and service of their faith, on the sacrifice and service of the faith of the people here and on the sacrifice and service of the faith of God's elect outside. Make sense? Our text is 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Look at verse 15. And in this confidence, Paul said, I intended to come to you before that you might have a second benefit, to pass by way of you to Macedonia, to come again from Macedonia to you, and be helped by you on my way to Judea. Therefore, verse 17 when I was planning this, did I do it lightly? Or the things I plan, do I plan according to the flesh that with me there should be yes, yes, and no, no? No, Paul says. But as God is faithful, verse 18, our word to you was not yes and no. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, by me, Silvanus, and Timothy, was not yes and no, but in him was yes. For all the promises of God in him are yes. And in him, amen, to the glory of God through us. Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us, 
is God, who has also sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. As we consider Paul's example in Corinth, I want us to examine here three fundamental necessities of effective and fruitful gospel ministry. Right? I want us to consider three fundamental necessities of effective and fruitful gospel ministry. As you think through the text, as you think through Paul's example, and you consider, as a Christian, how can I minister to my brothers and sisters in the church? How can I minister effectively with the gospel to lost people in my circumstances, in my life? How can I be effective in the ministry and calling that God has placed upon me? How can I fulfill my indebtedness with the gospel effectively, fruitfully, for the sake of his name. I want us to consider three fundamental necessities of effect, effective and fruitful gospel ministry from the example of Paul. First, I want us to consider our heart and mind for ministry from verses 15 and 16, our heart and mind for ministry. Secondly, we want to consider our character and conduct in ministry verses 17 and 18. And lastly, point three, we want to consider our foundation and motivation for ministry, verses 19 through 22. Our heart and mind for ministry, our character and conduct in ministry, and lastly, our foundation and motivation for ministry. So let's first consider the right heart, the right mind for ministry, exemplified by the Apostle Paul here in verses 15 and 16. Now Paul begins, verse 15, by referring to the confidence that he expressed in verses 12 through 14. That confidence is the confidence that arises from the testimony of a clear conscience that we discussed last Lord's Day, right? The confidence that is the fruit of godly character, the confidence that is the fruit of godly conduct, godly integrity, operating according to godly principles, operating according to godly priorities. When you do that, it gives you great confidence in the Lord, doesn't it? When you prepare, when you plan, think, act, and hope, and pray in accord with biblically informed, with a biblically informed and affirming conscience, it produces a certain faith-filled confidence. It's the confidence to say what needs to be said, the confidence to do what needs to be done, trusting the Lord. Paul tells it like it is, and what you see with Paul is what you get right? It's that kind of confidence that comes from having a clear conscience before the Lord. This is not someone, Paul is not someone who is tossed to and fro. He's not someone who is unstable in all his ways, anxious, vacillating, right? Duplicitous. Paul has confidence in the Lord. And Paul says in verse 15, it's in this confidence that I intended to come to you before. Now, Paul is referring here in verse 15, to his travel plans, those travel plans that we discussed in some detail last Lord's Day. From 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 through 9, Paul had intended to stay in Ephesus until Pentecost, if the Lord permits. And then after Pentecost, he would pass through Corinth by way of Macedonia, and he was passing through to collect an offering for the poor in Jerusalem. He intended to spend some time with them, wanted to spend some time with them before heading on to Judea. In the meantime, although Paul had intended to do that, in the meantime, Timothy, sent by Paul, pays a visit to Corinth. And when Timothy comes back to give a report to Paul, he reports that in Corinth there is a full-scale mutiny underway. False teachers, false apostles are accusing Paul left and right. Paul's apostolic authority is being undermined. It's come under fire. And that work of the false teachers, the false apostles, these accusations are hindering the work of ministry. The people in Corinth begin to doubt Paul's authority. For that reason, for their sake, for the sake of the church, Paul determines to go to Corinth immediately and deal with the rebellion. Now it's likely at this point, as Paul decides to go back to Corinth, that Paul intends to make two passes through Corinth. One on the way to deal with the rebellion and to take up the offering, the collection for the poor saints in Jerusalem, and another on the way back, right? To come back through to collect another offering. And in collecting that other offering, having the church at Corinth send him 
with help to Jerusalem. Paul considers this two experiences of grace, two blessings, two benefits, right? We see these plans referred to in verse 16, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 16. Paul intended, he said, to pass by way of you to Macedonia and to come again from Macedonia to you and be helped by you on my way to Judea. Now, Paul's trip, first trip, turns out to be far more difficult than anticipated. And we have what's referred to in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1, as a very sorrowful or a painful visit. So Paul then returns to Ephesus. He doesn't continue through Macedonia. Paul returns to Ephesus and writes a very sorrowful or painful letter. We see that in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4. And Paul's plans change again. Look at chapter 2, verse 1. Paul said, but I determined this within myself, that I would not come again to you in sorrow. For if I make you sorrowful, then who is he who makes me glad but the one who is made sorrowful by me? And I wrote this very thing to you, lest when I came I should have sorrow over those from whom I ought to have joy. So essentially Paul's travel plans changed not only once, but changed twice. And his opponents, his accusers in Corinth, have an absolute field day with what they refer to as Paul's duplicity or Paul's fickleness. You can't trust Paul, they say, right? He can't even keep his word with something as simple and as mundane as travel plans. How can you trust him with the word of God? However, in this context, Paul displays here, what Paul displays here is an undivided heart and a thoughtful mind for ministering to the people at Corinth. I want us to pick up on this. Notice Paul's heart in verse 15. Paul says, And in this confidence, I intended to come to you before, so that, for the purpose that, you might have a second benefit. Now that little word, that, in the middle of verse 15 there, explains Paul's heart motive for initially adding a second pass through Corinth, that you might have a second benefit. The Greek word, word there for benefit is the word charis. It means grace. It means grace. The ESV translates this, that you might have a second experience of grace. I think it's more accurate, right? A second experience of grace. So, contra his opponents... Regardless of all the accusations flying around about Paul, Paul didn't decide to do this for selfish reasons, as he was accused of doing. He wasn't attempting to fleece the flock, skim some off the top for himself. Paul wasn't being greedy. Paul wasn't taking advantage of the believers in Corinth. Paul's heart was to see them blessed. Do you see? Adding a second visit was an act of love on the part of Paul to the Corinthian church. To have them experience the grace of God twice. Paul's intention was for God's grace to be poured out on them abundantly. And Paul thought of both visits to Corinth as the grace of God to them. The Philippians also had proved to be very generous to Paul. They cared for his needs many times, Paul says. And where was Paul's heart and mind in this giving and receiving from the church in Philippi? Paul's heart and mind wasn't on himself. It was on the Philippians. Paul said, not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. So desiring now from the heart to see the Corinthians blessed by the grace of God, Paul determined in his mind then to make it happen. He was thoughtful. He was creative. Paul arranged his plans to accommodate more grace for them. Do you see? It seems simple, doesn't it? I'm going to, essentially, Paul is going to inconvenience himself, make two trips through Corinth so that they could experience a second blessing of grace. Paul's going to accommodate his plans so that they can participate in a second blessing, a second experience of grace, as the ESV states it. I'll pass through once and collect an offering. I'll pass through on my way back so that whatever else they want to give, I can collect that too and allow them to send me on to Jerusalem with help. 
right? To participate in that gift that is going to Jerusalem for the, the needy saints there. So considering the, the very circumstance in which divisive men find opportunity to slander Paul, we see Paul's heart and mind devoted to ministering to the saints at Corinth, right? And the application, the application of this, Paul's example here, is straightforward, really simple. And we want to think about this for ourselves in our own responsibility to ministry. Am I thoughtful in this way? Do I consider my brothers, do I consider my sisters in the plans that I make? Am I willing to go out of my way to help a brother, help a sister, to love them, to minister to them, to see some grace given to them? Do I consistently look for and take opportunities to bless my brothers, bless my sisters? Am I willing to change my schedule? For the sake of ministry. For some it may be, am I willing to show up? Am I willing to show up? Church life, your ministry, my ministry, is not coming to church on a Sunday and listening to a sermon. It's not church life. It's not ministry. Am I looking out for my own interests or am I looking out for the interests of others? Am I willing to be inconvenienced for their benefit? You know, I was um, thinking about this as I was considering this in the last few days that we had a group of people from our church that went to Puerto Rico. They're, I believe, probably there now. And um, they were going to uh, land in Puerto Rico and get a cab, the way I understand the story, and get a cab to take them uh, around Puerto Rico. Uh, but we know a pastor in Puerto Rico and he's a busy man. I know this brother. Uh, he's a good brother and a busy man. He's got a busy ministry, a lot on his plate. You know, the storm went through Puerto Rico. They're still recovering from all that. So his response was, no, I'm not going to let them get a cab. I'm going to come pick them up and take them. <laughs> right? Uh, just willing to, to, to want to be a blessing to brothers and sisters from our church. Wanting to love them in that way. They don't need to get a cab. I'm going to take them. <laughs> And from what I understand, he's going to drive them around Puerto Rico. <laughs> so it's a blessing, right? Do we think of ministry in that way? Are we thoughtful in that way? Is that our heart to see our brothers and sisters blessed? And then how do we go about seeing that that happens? What kinds of decisions do we make to see them receive that blessing, that grace from God? Paul was thoughtful in this way. Paul's heart was that way. And then Paul's mind set to do these things, set to do that, set to see them blessed in Corinth. Paul's heart and mind for ministry. Second, secondly, consider with me our character and our conduct in ministry from verses 17 and 18. Our character and our conduct in ministry. Look at verse 17. Paul says, therefore, when I was planning all this, did I do it lightly or the things I plan, do I plan according to the flesh that with me there should be yes, yes, and no, no? But as God is faithful, our word to you is not yes and no. Despite what Paul's accusers say, the changes to Paul's travel plans do not reflect a flaw, a flaw in Paul's character. This is not a flaw in Paul's character. This is Paul's heart for ministry, his mind for ministry, flowing into his character, his conduct in ministry. Paul establishes that fact through the use of two rhetorical questions here that both expect an immediate and indignant no way answer. The first question is this, when I was planning, did I do it lightly? The expected answer was no way. No way did I do it lightly. The second question is this, did I plan according to the flesh? Paul would give an immediate and an indignant, no way answer. The word lightly there in verse 17 has the sense of frivolously. Did I do it frivolously? In other words, did I do it impulsively, without care? Did I do it thoughtlessly, without concern for you? Paul would say, no way. In fact, in fact, the concept of planning, 
mentioned in verse 17, wouldn't even work in this sense. The one who is impulsive, thoughtless, frivolous, doesn't plan, right? Paul is here planning. And we know clearly that Paul did not conduct himself in this manner. We can see it all over the New Testament. The testimony of his proven character bears witness against the notion that this was all done frivolously or done thoughtlessly. And the Corinthians knew better. Right? The Corinthians knew Paul. They knew his pattern of life. Paul had labored among them to plant that church for 18 months. They knew Paul's character. So the second question then, did I plan according to the flesh, is equally as absurd. Right? To plan according to the flesh is to say that Paul waffled, that he vacillated back and forth like an unstable, worldly, lost person without the Spirit of God. Right? Walking, thinking, planning according to the flesh. To the point where yes, yes, and no, no are coming out of his mouth in the same breath. Right? Paul, here again, is being accused of being duplicitous. Looking them in the eye and saying yes while thinking in his mind, there's no way this is going to happen. <laughs> right? Being duplicitous. He's being accused of vacillating. So how else do you explain all the changes to his plans, his opponents might ask. How else can you explain how fickle Paul is? Paul is making decisions based on personal whim. And these accusations in Corinth took a foothold. Paul lived at a time in the first century where keeping your word was highly valued. Even and especially keeping your word under difficult circumstances. Fickleness was despised. That waffling, that kind of going back on your word, was especially among leaders, it was despised. Today, a basic character trait of this world is to abandon your word at a whim for the sake of personal gain, right? Look at our politics. Nobody keeps their word. <laughs> and it's virtuous to get away with it, so to speak. Everything today is political. It's a virtual, constant stream of lies. And listen, it hasn't, hasn't been that long ago, not that many generations ago, where my word is my bond, right? You have my word. You could make an agreement with a guy on a handshake and expect that that would be kept. And we've come a long way from that. But it's not just politicians. Jeremiah 9.5 describes our day well. Where Jeremiah says, everyone will deceive his neighbor and will not speak the truth. They have taught their tongue to speak lies and they weary themselves to commit iniquity. That describes our day and age. A Christian, Paul, understands his ministry. His character is important to his effectiveness in ministry for this church at Corinth on their behalf. Christian, listen, your conduct, your character is critically important to your effectiveness, your fruitfulness in ministry. You have to have a character, you have to have conduct above reproach. A Christian had better keep his word. A Christian had better keep his word. Psalm 101 verse 7, he who works deceit shall not dwell within my house. He who tells lies shall not continue in my presence. In other words, all liars have their place in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 22. Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord. Right? A Christian had better keep his word. Paul kept his word. So Paul then, back in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul defends his character and defends his conduct then in a very specific, in a very interesting way. And he does this by appealing to the faithfulness of God in verse 18. Look at verse 18 there. Paul's not a liar. Paul doesn't plan on a whim. He's not being thoughtless or frivolous. Paul says in verse 18, but as God is faithful, our word to you was not yes and no. In other words, as God is faithful, my word to you is faithful also. Now, I want us to make this connection. This is important. There are many that view this as an oath, right? With God as my witness, they would say, I was not being fickle or thoughtless or a liar. And he does use, in fact, 
oath language in verse 23. We see it there clearly. However, in verse 18, this does not appear to be as much an oath as it is a statement of fact. As God is faithful, my word to you is faithful also. God's faithfulness is the basis for or the grounds for, Paul says, my faithfulness. God, if you think about this, God is immutable. God does not change. God never goes back on his word. With God, James says, there is no variation or shadow of turning. The very basis of God's faithfulness is his divine attribute of immutability, the fact that God does not change. God never waffles. God is never thoughtless. God never lies. God is never frivolous. God is therefore our steadfast hope, and all his promises in Christ are sure. Amen? Numbers chapter 23, verse 19. God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said, and will he not also do? Or has he spoken, and will he not also make it good? So what does Paul then mean by a statement in verse 18? But as God is faithful, our word to you is not yes and no. One commentator put Paul's words this way. Paul would say, how could I possibly preach to you the good news of a God who always acts with your best interests at heart, who never fails to fulfill his promises, and then turn around and treat you with utter disregard by behaving in a double-minded and self-serving way? You see what Paul's saying, essentially? Paul effectively says, I can't do that. My ministry to you would essentially be a complete contradiction if I did that. Nothing could be more incongruous. In saying this, and making this statement in verse 18, Paul connects the character of God's servants directly with the character of God himself. There cannot be incongruity. This is how a Christian thinks, how a Christian acts, how a Christian lives, how a Christian conducts himself. This is the character of God's bondservant that God's bondservant reflects the character and attributes of God. That he's going to be godly. That he's going to be Christ-like in his ministry, in his love, in his decisions, in his planning, in his thoughtfulness. Paul says, I simply cannot make it the practice of my ministry to be fickle and lying. I can't make it the practice of my ministry to be neglectful or thoughtless or frivolous when God, my master, is faithful, I must be faithful. I want you to think about the gravity, the weight of that statement for a moment. Can you and I say, with a clear conscience before God, that our ministry to the lost, that our ministry to God's people is a faithful reflection of the faithfulness of God? You are his minister. You are his. If you're in Christ, you are his ambassador. You're his emissary. Does your character, does your conduct reflect well the character and conduct of God? That's staggering implications, doesn't it? That's essentially what it means to be Christ-like, isn't it? We are to be like Christ in our ministry to God's people, in our ministry to the lost, we're to be Christ-like. This drives Paul's character. This reality drives Paul's conduct in Corinth. How can I, Paul asks essentially, how can I be insincere? How can I play the hypocrite? It's my calling, right? How can I avoid my responsibility to these people. How can I be thoughtless? How can I be frivolous? How can I be careless? How can I be selfish? As my God is loving, as Christ has loved me, how can I not be loving? As Christ has been selfless toward me, how can I not be selfless toward my brother? 
as my God is concerned with my spiritual growth and maturity in Christ, how can I not be concerned for my brother's spiritual growth? As God pursued me, how can I not pursue them? As God is faithful, as his ambassador, I must be faithful, right? This also ties directly with another inference from verse 18. As God is faithful, consider verse 18. As God is faithful, as he has promised to work all things together for your good, and as he has ordained to use means in accomplishing that good, and because you and I are one means that God uses to effect that good, Paul says, my word to you is faithful. It wasn't thoughtless. It wasn't frivolous. It wasn't vacillating. It wasn't duplicitous. Everything worked out as it should have worked out because I am God's means and God is faithful, right? Sort of see that inferred in verse 18. We'll consider more the character of God and its impact on the life and ministry of Paul as we pick up verses 19 and 22 uh, next Lord's Day. I want to get back from Haiti. So now, for now, consider the implications of our text, all right? 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 15 here through 18. If you're a Christian, brother, sister, you've been given a ministry. You've been given a ministry. You've been given a ministry priority. If you've been given a ministry, if you've been set apart by God to the gospel for the sake of his name, then devote your heart and mind to that ministry, following the example of Paul. Devote your heart and mind to that ministry. It doesn't necessarily mean you're going to go into full-time ministry or that you're going to travel and be a missionary somewhere. You're a missionary here. You're a missionary now. You have disciple-making work to do in this church for the benefit, for the blessing of these dear people. You have a ministry to the lost outside those doors with the gospel to see lost people saved. Devote your heart and mind to ministry. You've been given that stewardship. Follow the example of Paul. Thirdly, align your character and align your conduct with the character and conduct of the one who has employed you. With the one who has employed you. You are to be the faithful means that God intends you to be. The faithful means that God uses to reach a lost world with the gospel. All praise, honor, and glory to the one who is faithful to his word. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Let's take a few moments and pray silently. Ask the Lord to convict you where you've sinned. Humble your heart. Ask the Lord to, by his spirit, instruct you, correct you from his word. Let's repent of our sin and pledge ourselves to obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. Amen. Let's pray. Amen.